Great. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to be with you all here today to talk about um, mathematical models of curiosity. And as Anthony was just saying, um, it draws a bit from a book that just came out called Curious Minds, The Power of Connection from MIT Press that I wrote with my twin, um, Perry Zern. But I wanted to um, kind of explain a little bit about where this piece of it fits into the broader context. Um, so the book itself is very interdisciplinary. We cover topics from philosophy and literature and pedagogy all the way through to neuroscience, mathematics, psychology, linguistics, and data science. Um, but this particular talk or lunchtime talk or colloquium is just going to focus on three of those uh, disciplines, mathematics, philosophy, and psychology. And because I'm going to be focusing on three different disciplines, it means that it's going to have more philosophy and psychology, um, or sorry, more, more philosophy and math than a typical psychology colloquium, um, and less disciplinary detail in any of those three areas due to time constraints. So um, I'm happy for you to ask as many questions as you want, and I'll try to cover the ideas in a way that is accessible to people who are coming from any of these disciplines or even surrounding disciplines. Um, but to get started, I want to ask the broad question, uh, what is curiosity? So when I ask that question, typically multiple things come into people's minds, and they range. Here are three examples that are really common. One is the idea that curiosity is the love of trivia. And um, so somebody who's really curious is the person who pulls out Trivial Pursuit every time they have um, people over for the evening. Um, another example of something that pops into your mind when you think about what is curiosity is the two-year-old who asks an unending string of questions. That is sort of the epitome of curiosity um, for some of us in our minds. And then a third really common example is curiosity in the classroom. So when you look as a teacher, when you look across the classroom um, and you see people's hands raised, that feels like a moment that's quintessentially curious. But if we think about it for a little bit longer, we could probably all come up with examples of um, people who are curious, who we know in our lives, that don't necessarily fall into any of these categories. So maybe we know somebody who's curious, and uh, but they hate Trivial Pursuit. Their trivia is just like not the thing that gets them excited. Um, similarly, we can think about people, and particularly young people, who are curious in the classroom, but for um, reasons of introversion or family context um, or other experiences, they may not be the kids who are raising their hands and asking questions. They may be curious internally and save their questions and just do a lot of listening. So what this indicates to us that we have common examples in our minds, but we can also see counter examples really quickly suggests that defining curiosity is really difficult. And that's not something that we are observing newly today. Um, the sort of difficulty and challenge in defining curiosity is something that has been with us for 2000 years. Um, so if we go back to Augustine, um, in, he wrote in 397 that curiosity is a lust to experience and find out. Thomas Aquinas in 1270 writes that curiosity is the desire to know. Descartes in 1649 writes that curiosity is a desire to understand. John Locke, a little bit later, suggests that curiosity is an appetite after knowledge. William James, the psychologist, in 1899, writes that curiosity is the impulse toward better cognition. And John Dewey, in 1933, writes that curiosity is an interest in problems provoked by the observation of things and the accumulation of material. About 50 years later, Voss in um, 1983 suggests that curiosity is a motivational prerequisite of exploratory behavior, so very much focusing on motivation as sort of a new um, uh, take on curiosity. And then George Lowenstein in 1994 writes that curiosity is a feeling of deprivation produced by information gaps. And so we um, fill in information gaps because of that feeling of deprivation. And lastly, I wanted to mention Celeste Kidd, who in 2015 wrote this really wonderful review article on the psychology and neuroscience of curiosity, and she writes that curiosity is a drive state for information. 
So there are some similarities across these definitions, and there are also marked differences. But what I want to do is not necessarily focus on the differences, but focus on the sort of structure of these definitions. All of them suggest that curiosity is a state or action or feeling um, that then drives us to gain knowledge knowledge, information, better cognition, etc. So I sort of want to ask about that last piece, that object. What is it that we are searching for? What is that what is it that we hope to find? Um, what is it that we're motivated toward or desirous of? Um, and uh, that motivates the question of what knowledge really is. And um, I come from a, a, the perspective that knowledge is something that is not a single piece of information. It is a connected pattern of information that allows us to do new things in our lives. Um, and that idea that knowledge is a network of interconnected pieces of information is not new to me. Um, it is something that philosophers, scholars, um, mathematicians, and other scientists have suggested for a very long time. I like to go back to Henri Poincaré, who's a mathematician, a French mathematician, who suggested um, that the aim of science is not things themselves, as the dogmatists in their simplicity imagine, but the relations among things. Outside these relations, there is no reality knowable. Um, and that suggests that what's important about science and what's important about um, gaining scientific knowledge is that it is a pattern of related pieces of information, and it's the relations that matter. If you just collect independent units of information, you'll never be able to reason with them. Reasoning requires juxtaposing two pieces of information and understanding their relations. Um, so that focus on relationality is also something that John Dewey talks a lot about, um, and he actually has this one passage which suggests that knowledge is, and this is a quote, knowledge is such a network of interconnections that any past experience would offer a point of advantage from which to get at the problems presented in a new experience. And so that passage foregrounds the mental affordance of a relational knowledge. And that is that once you understand how pieces of information in your world are connected, then you can use that to change your decision, alter your behavior, do things differently um, in the future. So I want to ask if knowledge is a network then, um, and curiosity is the drive for knowledge, then we can think about curiosity as sort of a walk in a knowledge space um, where we step onto ideas and then connect one idea to the next as we, as we take a step or, or part or yeah, take a step through the coordinate space um, of knowledge. So here's a simple sort of conceptual picture of what I mean. So a concept may have a particular coordinate in an n-dimensional space of knowledge, and then we connect one concept to another, and that leads to an edge or a relation inside of the network. So with each step, we're adding an edge, and each step we're building the network um, to be bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, or to remove edges that uh, are no longer needed or are proven um, inaccurate. So with this sort of uh, consumption in our mind, we can think about what curiosity's walk actually looks like. Um, and that's something that motivates us to consider se testing several mathematical theories of curiosity using an edge-based or network-based approach. So what I'm gonna do over the next couple of minutes is to um, break my remarks down into three sections. In the first section, I want to test some philosophical theories of individual curiosity, and it will foreground this connectional account of curiosity. In the second section, I want to test philosophical theories not of individual curiosity, but of collective curiosity. So what happens when we all get together and we're curious together? And then in the third and final section, I want um, to provide some um, uh, information about a study where we test psychological theories um, as opposed to philosophical theories. But collectively, these three studies, I hope, will emphasize the fact that um, curiosity can be usefully thought of as a connective practice, and that allows us to test theories in ways that we couldn't have done before. Okay, so let's get started with the first section, testing philosophical theories of individual curiosity. So here, what I want to do is to begin with some of Perry Zern's work, um, where he went back over the last two millennia of literature from the philosophical um, and historical traditions 
oh, I should also mention this is in the Western intellectual tradition. Um, and so that's an important caveat because there can be other results that may be identified if um, other intellectual traditions were examined. But just in the Western intellectual tradition, he used what's called a historical philosophical method, which is where you will um, search for terms that you're interested in across different languages and identify how those terms are being used in a particular corpus. So what he did is that he studied words for curiosity in several languages, Greek, Latin, French, German, and English. He also searched for synonymous phrases of curiosity and interrogative sentences. And as he was doing this, what he was searching for is a pattern whereby curiosity was described in particular ways consistently across those 2000 years and across those different languages. So in that evaluation, what he found is that there are three sort of figures of curiosity that are very consistently present in the literature and that suggests that there are phenotypes of curious individuals. The first one of those three um, is referred to in the older literature as the busybody, but in the newer literature, you can kind of think about it as um, a, a butterfly in the sense of a social butterfly, um, but the, the sort of historical term would be a busybody. So I'm going to give you passages just as illustrations of this concept. This is not a comprehensive account um, of his historical digging um, and excavation work, but it does, uh, I hope, provide you with some intuition about what these styles are like. So for the busybody, we can go back to Plutarch, um, who wrote in his On Curiosity, um, and the busybody, shunning the country as something stale and uninteresting and undramatic, pushes into the bazaar and the marketplace and the harbors asking, is there any news? So you can kind of see this person uh, running around through the bazaar and the marketplace, just asking anybody um, about anything and everything. They, this person just wants all of the information. Today, you would think about that as somebody who has um, maybe 100 tabs open on their um, computer. Uh, Martin Heidegger also in his Being in Time writes about curiosity um, and idle talk, and he writes that curiosity is the not staying with what is nearest, or the distraction by new possibilities, or the never dwelling anywhere. So these two examples foreground um, for us that the busybody is someone who's collecting bits of information that are less um, connected than they otherwise might be. They're taking sort of random steps. I'll take this information and that information and this information, um, and there may not be any rhyme or reason to how they're walking through knowledge space. And I want to contrast that style with a second really common style that Perry excavated, and that's um, the hunter. And this term is actually used frequently in the literature uh, in relation to curiosity hunting. So back at, in Plutarch again, he writes that if you have to be curious, he, he suggests that you shouldn't be. I mean, definitely don't be curious, he writes. But if you have to be curious, don't, quote, turn aside and follow every scent, but keep your sense of smell pure and untainted for its proper task. So if you're going to be curious, at least focus in on what it is that you're trying to discover and, and remain attentive. Um, then if we fast forward significantly to Nietzsche in his Beyond Good and Evil, he writes that the man of curiosity, and he uses the that gendered term, um, so I'm using it as a historical nod to what Nietzsche was saying, although we can think about that more broadly, obviously. Um, but he writes that the man of curiosity wishes he had a few hundred helpers and good, well-trained hounds that he could drive into the history of the human soul to round up his game. And then lastly, Jacques Derrida, in The Animal That Therefore I Am, writes, to be curious is to track, to sniff, to trail, and to follow some of the reasons for the so confident usage of words. So the hunter is someone, as you can see, who is seeking pieces of information and building one upon another, um, sniffing, trailing, following the scent. Um, and so this person is building a knowledge of connected informational units, not sort of randomly uh, jumping around the way that the busybody does. The third and final style that Perry excavated um, is called the dancer, and the very cut, so the dancer, the word dancer is often used in connection to these passages, um, but the other really common word that is used in these passages is leaping or leap, um, 
So, uh, and that's distinct from what the busybody is doing and from what the hunter is doing. I'm going to read you two passages. Um, one is from Nietzsche's Gay Science, where he's talking about thinkers of the future and sort of envisioning what thinkers of the future might be like. And he writes, we do not belong to those who have ideas only among books or when stimulated by books. It is our habit to think outdoors, walking, leaping, climbing, dancing, preferably on lonely mountains or near the sea where even the trails become thoughtful. Our first questions about the value of a book, of a human being, or a musical composition are, can they walk even more? Can they dance? And then Michel Foucault in The Masked Philosopher writes, I can't help but dream about a kind of criticism. I think about writing reviews of papers every time I read this passage. I can't help but dream about a kind of criticism that would try not to judge, but to bring an avoir, a book, a sentence, an idea to life. It would light fires, watch the grass grow, listen to the wind and catch the sea foam in the breeze and scatter it. It would multiply not judgments, but signs of existence. It would summon them, drag them from their sleep. Perhaps it would invent them sometimes, all the better. I'd like a criticism of scintillating leaps of the imagination. I dream of a new age of curiosity. So what's consistent across these two examples, but also the many others that Perry excavated, is that the dancer is somebody who is leaping between different knowledge clusters. So they may be existing in one space and they may leap to another one. Um, and so that kind of phenotype is something that we should end up seeing in the network architectures that people are building. So that leads me to the question of, um, if we now have philosophical theories of the kinds of curiosity that humans might evince, could we demonstrate that those exist today using tools of modern science? Or is it possible that the information age has ruined our curiosity um, and uh, taken us into new di different directions where we don't display the same kinds of curiosity as people did over the last 2000 years? So to address those questions, we collaborated with David Leiden Staley, who's a professor of um, communication at the Annenberg School at Penn. And what he was really interested in doing is um, understanding how people move from idea to idea as they are curious. Um, and he decided to focus on <clears throat> using Wikipedia <clears throat> and the browsing of Wikipedia. Um, as an example context in which people are curious, and he wanted to know whether he could see some of these styles in that um, type of browsing. So what he did is that he ran a study with 149 participants. They were asked to browse Wikipedia for 15 minutes a day for 21 days. So for each person, we had over five hours of data. Collectively, they visited 18,654 pages. And to understand how they're stepping through this network and what sort of networks they're building in their minds, what we did is that we quantified the um, similarity, the semantic similarity between the two pages that people would step between. So if somebody is um, on the page for war elephant and then goes to the page for elephant, we quantified how large this distance was. We used what's called term frequency inverse document frequency, which is a natural language processing statistic that allows us to assess the semantic similarity between two pages. Um, here on the right hand side, what I'm showing you is an example of three different participants who stepped very differently on um, the Wikipedia network. So this first column, as you can see, is somebody um, with each of their steps or each edge that they laid down. And the color indicates the cosine similarity between the two pages. Um, and so something, a low value means that the two pages are very different and a high value means that the two pages are very similar. So this particular per person is stepping between pages there that are very dissimilar from one another. And that's in contrast to the person in the third column here, who you can see has some steps that are actually between concepts that are very similar or pages that are very similar. And then this middle column is just a third person um, who has intermediate step size. Now, with that information, we can um, state some explicit hypotheses about what phenotypes or what uh, characteristics of the data we would see from hunters and what characteristics of the data we would see from busybodies. 
So let's start with the hunter. The hunter is somebody who is going to track and sniff and trail. So they're going to be following pieces of information that are related to one another. And therefore, we hypothesize that they would be building networks that have relatively high clustering coefficient. That's defined in binary networks as the proportion of triangles over the number of connected triples. And um, it is an indication of how locally clustered the network is. So our hypothesis is that the hunter is going to build networks that have high clustering. And um, a correlate to that is that the network will have relatively um, low path length. It will be easy to get from one piece of the network to another piece of the network using short steps because um, most of the concepts are related to one another. Now, in contrast to that hypothesis, we suggested that the busybody would be somebody who is, as you can see from this picture here, jumping between ideas that are pretty dissimilar and pretty far apart. So what that suggests is that their networks are going to have relatively low clustering coefficient and relatively high path length. Now, the final piece of um, the final hypothesis that we stated up front is that there should be a relationship between the kinds of networks that people are building in, while they're browsing Wikipedia and a particular personality trait that's called deprivation sensitivity. So individuals who are high on deprivation sensitivity have a drive to eliminate the unknown as they encounter new information and recognize gaps in their knowledge. So this person who has is very sensitive to deprivation, particularly epistemic deprivation, is someone that we hypothesize would be more like a hunter. They are somebody who would build networks with relatively high clustering coefficient. Okay, so let's see some of the data. Here along the y-axis is the average clustering coefficient, and then here along the x-axis is the deprivation sensitivity. Um, each data point is a single person inside of the experiment. So what you can see is that there is a positive correlation between these two um, variables, suggesting that individuals who are relatively high on deprivation sensitivity, so those hunters, tend to construct networks that have a high clustering coefficient consistent with our um, hypotheses. By contrast, individuals who are low on deprivation sensitivity, so these are the busybodies, tend to build networks with relatively low clustering coefficient. And we can see um, the inverse relationship in the characteristic path length as we would hypothesize. Now, I will note that there is significant variability here. We don't see two populations. There are busybodies and there are hunters. That's not what we see. We see that there's a continuum between these two extremes um, where some people show intermediate um, uh, network building processes. Now, I don't have the data in this um, slide deck, but I did want to mention that you can also separate the data into uh, early, middle, and late browsing to ask whether participants um, who tend to be busybody-like on the first day are also busybody-like all the way through um, or not. So is this network building style a trait of an individual or is it state dependent? And we see evidence for a combination of state and trait-like components. So an individual who is very busybody-like on their first week of browsing stays relatively busybody-like for the second and third weeks of browsing. But there is some variability um, that is actually explained by uh, all variable levels of sensation seeking from day to day for that participant. So that suggests that there are both state and trait components to network building processes. So that then brings us to the second part of the talk, where what I'd like to do is to stick with the philosophical theories, but now move from um, philosophical theories of individual curiosity to philosophical uh, theories of collective curiosity. And this is work that was led by Harong Shu, who was a graduate student in the lab um, who recently started a postdoc at MIT. I almost said MIT Press, not at MIT Press, at MIT, the university. Um, okay, so also all of these little cartoon people are made by Harong. Um, he loves to make cartoons. And so this whole section has illustrations from him. So he was really interested in three philosophical theories of collective curiosity, particularly in the context of science. Um, and those theories <clears throat> I'm going to name by the thinkers who 
wrote about them. So Kuhn, for example, suggests that science progresses through periods of what he called normal science and then separated by paradigm shifts. Fire Robin is the second thinker that we um, consider, and he suggests that there's no characteristic pattern to scientific development. And then Lakatosh is the third thinker that we consider. Um, he suggests that science progresses as a research program, which has core postulates and an auxiliary set of hypotheses. Now, if you just read those statements, you might wonder, well, how do we go about testing each of these um, hypotheses and, and acquiring data that can actually support them? Um, what we do is that we want to operationalize these statements in the context of network science um, in support of this connectional uh, curiosity approach. So to do that, we are going to start with um, Wikipedia again, but now not as participants are browsing it, we are just going to study the structure of Wikipedia and the information that's present in it as an outcome of and history of scientific curiosity. So what we do is that we take each page <clears throat> in the science sections of Wikipedia and we treat them as a node in a network. And then we treat hyperlinks between pages as edges in the network. Now to understand how science concepts um, develop and how the, how the network grows, we need to be able to have dates assigned to every page. For us, to, what we did is that we estimated a date for each concept by looking at the history section on the page and pulling out the first date in the history section. In the supplement of the paper, we also um, do some uh, manual assessments of exactly of actually looking through the historical record to find dates, original dates for concepts, and then evaluate um, the uh, the confidence intervals that we have around our automatic, automated assessments. Okay, with that data, we can then recast those three different theories that I mentioned in terms of the network architecture. So Kuhn, as I mentioned, suggests that science is progressing by what he calls normal science, um, separated by paradigm shifts. And when he describes normal science, he describes it as puzzle solving. Now, what we think is that if we are solving puzzles, that suggests that we are filling in um, holes in the network such that we should see relatively high clustering of the networks that are created. So um, we uh, may connect different ideas to one another, and then we start to fill in and solve the puzzle um, by connecting the um, pieces that are not yet connected to one another. So if uh, this puzzle solving is happening, we should see evidence for a growing clustering. Now for Lakatos, he's the one that suggested that there's a research program with a core set of postulates and then an auxiliary belt of hypotheses. If that is accurate, then we should see what's called core periphery structure in the network. Core periphery structure is where you have a core of densely interconnected concepts and then a periphery of more sparsely connected concepts. So we can search for core periphery structure in support of Lakatos's suggestions. And then finally, for Fire Robin, he's the one that suggested that science progresses with no characteristic pattern. Um, from a network perspective, that would mean that we would see networks that have relatively random topology. So if we see random topology, that would be in support of Fire Robin's hypothesis. So let's look at the science concept networks in Wikipedia and uh, examine some network statistics that would help us to either validate or dismiss some of these theories as operationalized in the previous page. So here what you see along the y-axis is a real value of a network statistics, and in this case the clustering coefficient, and then along the x-axis is the value expected in an edge-rewired uh, null model. The dashed line is the unity line, and what I want you to notice is that the data points here, each is a different science concept networks, network, so um, algebra is one, anatomy is one, geoscience is one, etc. What you can see is that all of those data points lie above the unity line. What that means is that real science concept networks have greater clustering coefficient than expected in an edgewired null model. Uh, so that is definitely in support of Kuhn's theory. And um, 
and sort of not in support of fire robin's hypothesis if if the if the um if the if science was progressing in a more random fashion we should see data points um straddling the unity line uh or being below the unity line so um, now I want to move to the middle and last sections here. On the middle is the modularity. So you can see that these um, science concept networks have higher modularity than expected in a null model. And modularity means that there are subcomponents or subsets of concepts that are densely interconnected with one another and sparsely interconnected between. And then coreness, which is an assessment of core periphery structure. You can see that the coreness is much higher in the science concept networks than expected. Uh, so that is certainly in support of um, Lakatos's uh, suggestions. But the fact that all of these network statistics um, show values that are unexpected in the null model suggests that we need something more than Fire Robin's description. There's something more than random organization here, and something more to explain. So I want to think a little bit more deeply about Lakatos's suggestion that there is a core set of postulates and then an auxiliary belt of hypotheses. Uh, what he suggests is that that, that core set of postulates is um, born early in a discipline's life, and then the auxiliary set of hypotheses is born later. So what we did is that we took all of the science concept networks, and you can see their, um, their names here, and assessed whether the nodes in the core were born earlier than those in the periphery or whether the nodes in the periphery were born earlier than those in the core. Uh, so the zero line is if um, core and periphery nodes are being born at roughly the same time. What you can see across all of these violin plots is that the majority of the density is at the zero line. What that suggests is that the core is not born significantly earlier than the periphery and the periphery is not born significantly later than the core. So this is not um, in direct support of Lakatos's suggestion. So where does that leave us? Well, we've seen that science concept networks are clustered and modular, not random. They have cores and peripheries. They simultaneously grow outward to the periphery and inward to fill the core. They're doing both at the same time. It's not that the core is born, born first and then spreads out to the periphery. We're actually filling in the core and expanding the periphery at the same time. We're growing in and we're growing out. Um, so that leaves us just with Kuhn's suggestion. Could he be right? Is normal science a process of puzzle solving or of filling in knowledge gaps? Well, to answer that question, we have to have a way of studying what where knowledge gaps are um, and finding them in the science concept networks. To do that, we use tools from applied algebraic topology, and particularly this tool, it's called persistent homology. It allows us to find holes of a variety of sizes. Um, so a zero dimensional hole is a missing link between two nodes. A one dimensional hole is missing links between four nodes, um, as indicated here. And then a, um, a two-dimensional hole is one that looks like this. So it's an octahedron without any connections in the center. So what we can do with persistent homology is to find holes of these kinds in science concept networks, and then ask if we see evidence for this puzzle solving or the filling in of gaps, the filling in of holes. So um, here's some data where um, along the y-axis is the cumulative frequency, along the x-axis is the lifetime of these holes or cavities. And then on the right-hand side, you see cumulative frequency, and then on the x-axis, the number of cavities that are present. In the darker line is the real data, and then in the peach line is the edger-wired null model. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about the, the uh, greenish line, which is a genetic model that we just that we developed. I just want you to really focus on the real versus the edge wired null model. So um, do we see evidence of Kuhn's normal science or the filling in of knowledge gaps? The answer is yes. So on the left-hand side, we're seeing that science concept networks um, fill gaps faster. So the gaps are shorter in um, 
in their lifetimes than would be expected in the edgewired null model. And also on the right hand side, what you're seeing is that fewer knowledge gaps are created and fewer are open in the real data than in the edgewired null model. So what that suggests is that yes, these gaps are being filled in faster um, and fewer are being created than expected if if science was happening at random. So that does suggest that knowledge gaps matter and that we are trying to fill them. Does that um, is, is that something that we do sort of by happenstance, or is it something that we know is important? Um, there seems to be evidence that we know that's important, at least subconsciously, um, because we uh, can assess what kinds of ideas are frequently awarded. Um, and we focused on studying which ideas are awarded Nobel Prizes as an assessment of the influence of these um, new concepts. And what we wanted to do was to ask, are the concepts that are frequently awarded a Nobel Prize ones that are creating and filling knowledge gaps, or are they um, sort of just filling in, in other ways? And what we observe is that Yes, Nobel Prizes are given for ideas that participate in these gaps or cavities in the network. To show you that, I'm showing you two more cumulative frequency plots. Um, and along the x-axis here is participation in the beginning of a cavity. That's, that's what's called a birth simplex. So that births a, a new cavity or a new hole in the network. Um, and then participation in a death simplex or the closing of a cavity. And you can see um, the Nobel Prize in the black and then the non-Nobel Prize winning ideas in the peach. So consistently what we see is that these influential nodes that are given awards are those that more frequently participate in both the birth on the left-hand side and the death of um, knowledge gaps. Now I do wanna put an asterisk on this result because we there is evidence to suggest that um, Nobel Prizes are not awarded in a way that is um, fully unbiased uh, to demographic information, or um, uh, in particular that there are, uh, that the individuals who are awarded Nobel Prizes tend to be of a particular race um, and gender. And so I do want to just put in, just put a footnote on this, um, that more work is needed um, to have an assessment of the value of an idea beyond um, the Nobel Prize. Okay, so what have we learned about collective curiosity in testing these philosophical theories? What we've learned is that <laughs> we don't see evidence for a random progression of science. Um, what we see evidence for is that science concepts um, are discovered and brought into our knowledge base in a way that is clustered, that is modular, um, that has a core periphery structure. But in contrast to Lakatos's suggestion, we don't see that we build a core first and then progress outward. We seem to be doing both at the same time, where we're filling in the core and expanding to the periphery, and that both kinds of work are um, valued in the field. Okay, so that brings me to the third and final section of the talk. Just to remind you where we have come from, we've studied two kinds of philosophical theories, one for individual curiosity and then one for collective curiosity. In this final few minutes, what I'd like to do is to turn to psychological theories of curiosity, particularly in individuals, um, and assess whether we can use the same sorts of network operationalizations to provide evidence in support of or not in support of those theories. So I'm going to discuss briefly three psychological theories, two that have been previously published and one that um, we developed in my lab. The first one is going to sound very familiar. You've already heard about this twice um, in the talk so far, and that is the information gap theory. So this was developed by George Lowenstein in 1994 um, or around that time. So in this theory or this theory views curiosity as the drive to obtain information that is missing from a mental model of the world. So it suggests that curiosity is pushing us toward filling gaps um, in our current mental model. 
Now, a second um, theory that I haven't talked about thus far, but that is also present in the literature, is called the compression progress theory. And this one views curiosity as a drive to obtain information that improves the compression of a mental model and thereby lowers its cost of representation. So if you think about how we represent mental models, how do we represent them in our minds? How do we encode them? How do we call them up from memory? Um, if a model is relatively compressible, then we'll be able to encode it uh, more easily, represent it more easily, and also call it up to mind more easily. So the compression progress theory suggests that as we are curious, what we're trying to do is to find pieces that we can add to our model that will allow us to compress it more. Now, the third and final theory that I'm going to mention here is one that we developed and we call it the conformational change theory. This one views information seeking behavior or curiosity as resulting in the creation of an expansive knowledge network not a compressed one um, that is embedded in a conceptual geometry and that conceptual geometry that embedding in the conceptual geometry allows our knowledge networks to have a conformational change or be flexible um, you can think about um, medical stents or you can think about um, enzymes or proteins that change in their shape um, that's what we think, uh, that's how we think about not mental models in our minds, are ones that have patterns of interconnection that are um, sparse enough that we can actually reshape them, such that some concepts that were close to one another initially are farther apart later as we get gain new information, or pieces that were far apart from one another initially can become closer together as we add new information. So that conformational change is important for flexible behavior. Now, I guess I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. What are the mental affordances of these three different theories? Why would any of them be meaningful for us as humans? Why would we want to fill information gaps, for example? And what could that, what would that drive? Well, if we're filling in information gaps consistently, and that's the reason why we're adding pieces of information, the kind of network that we're going to be building in our mind is one that is very dense, sort of like hyper dense, um, because we're going to fill every single hole. Um, and that is interesting. I mean, it's comprehensive. However, there is a possibility for um, cognitive rigidity in the sense that every piece is connected to every other. We sort of have a sense of knowing exactly how everything relates, and that can support um, a state of cognitive rigidity where changing our minds can be difficult. Um, the compression progress theory does something similar. Because we're trying to create networks that are compressible, that's going to ratchet up the density of the network that we are building, also potentially support cognitive rigidity. But the benefit of compression progress is that it will decrease the cost of representing um, our model of the world. The conformational change theory that we developed, we developed specifically to sort of counteract the, um, the negative effects of the previous two theories. So conformational change theory, in order to allow for this flexibility, it will drive us to build networks that are relatively um, less dense, and that will allow for cognitive flexibility, um, not cognitive rigidity. The downside is that um, we will be building networks that are costly to represent in our minds. Okay, so these are the three theories. How will we test them? I'm not going to go into the specifics of the methods, but I will put down the papers here in case people are curious. So for the information gap theory, we're going to use applied algebraic topology again. I had just spoken about that in the second section of the talk um, to figure out where the gaps are and how many of them there are. For compression progress, I'm going to use information theory to calculate network compressibility. And um, for the conformational change theory, I'm going to use mechanics similar to what we would use for studying enzymes. Um, and that allows us to calculate the conformational degrees of freedom or how much could the network be reshaped with new information. The data that we'll use to test the theories is the same data that I talked about in the first section of the talk where the 149 participants are browsing Wikipedia. So <clears throat> here's the first piece of data for the information gap theory. 
So what I'm showing you here is the number of gaps or cycles or cavities. We use those words interchangeably. I know that's probably confusing, but let's just call them gaps. So along the y-axis is the gaps, and then along the x-axis is the time of browsing, how many different pages they've walked between. In the green color, you see um, zero dimensional gaps, so missing connections between pieces of the network. In purple, you see the number of gaps that's expected in an edge wired null model. So notice that the true data, what humans are doing, is building fewer gaps than expected in an edge wired null model. That is in support of the information gap theory, that we're filling in gaps as we go, and that that's an important driver for how people are browsing or how people are being curious on Wikipedia. We see a similar effect if we look at one-dimensional gaps, not just zero-dimensional. So one-dimensional gaps, you can see the true data in this greenish color, and then the edge wired null model is in purple. You can see consistently that there are many fewer one-dimensional gaps than expected. So that's again in support of the information gap theory, that we're filling in the gaps as we go. The wrench in the story <laughs> is this one, where we study the two-dimensional gaps that's this beautiful octahedron with no connections in the middle. Um, here we see in blue what the humans are doing, and then in purple is the null model. And what you can see is that humans are building networks that have many, so many more of these large gaps than the null model would predict. So does that mean that we don't mind big gaps, that we're not sensitive to big gaps, that big gaps are really helpful for us to allow cognitive flexibility? Why is it that they exist? Um, I can't answer why, but I can say that this suggests that we need to have an explanation beyond the information gap theory, because if it was only filling information gaps that was driving curiosity, we would not see this last effect. So what else is going on? Well, is, is compression progress an explanatory factor? Maybe. So here along the y-axis is the compressibility of the networks that people are building, and along the x-axis is the time of browsing. In the red color is the true data from humans, and in purple is the edge wired null model. And you can see that people are building highly compressible networks, much more than expected um, in the null model. So that's definitely, this is data that is absolutely in support of compression progress. Okay, so we have data in support of the information gap theory, mostly except in the two-dimensional gap case. And we definitely see data in support of compression progress theory. What about our third and final theory, the conformational change theory? Here along the y-axis is the de conformational degrees of freedom of the networks that people are building. And along the x-axis is the time of browsing. In um, the pink color is the true data. And then in purple is the null model. And what you can see is that human participants are building networks that are highly conformable. They have many more conformational degrees of freedom than expected in a null model. What that suggests is that they're building networks that are flexible. Okay, so let's put all of those theories on the same page and um, summarize what we've observed. So we do see evidence in support of the information gap theory in one and two dimensions, but not, one, or zero and one dimensions, but not two. We see data in support of compression progress, and we see data in support of conformational change. Now, what I want to ask is, you know, it would have been nice if only one of these was supported by the data. <laughs> that would have made my life easier. However, the fact that there's a little bit of support for all of them drives the question of what does the combination afford for us? Maybe we need different drivers of curiosity because that helps us somehow. And so thinking about that, I think that this combination of drivers for curiosity provides a balance between building networks that have uh, can, can, could be associated with high cognitive rigidity and building networks that allow for cognitive flexibility. So we, there's a balance or potentially a trade-off um, between those two results, and therefore there are multiple drivers that help to arbitrate that trade-off. The second thing that this offers is a balance between costly and cheap mental representations. If compression progress theory was the only one that we saw support for, that would provide um, relatively cheap mental representations. And if the conformational change theory is the only one that we saw evidence for, that would provide relatively costly representations. But the fact that we see evidence for both suggests that um, the, the browsing patterns are 
are marking this, this balance or this trade-off between building costly and cheap mental representations. Okay, so um, that takes me through all of the data that I wanted to show you today. Um, let's just summarize what we talked about. So at the very beginning, I talked about how individual and collective curiosity can be operationalized as network building processes. And then I showed that network statistics can be used to validate philosophical and then psychological theories of curiosity. In the first section, we found evidence for ancient philosophical styles of curiosity being alive and well today in the browsing of Wikipedia, so the busybodies and the hunters. So um, our information age has not drastically altered how we engage with information. Um, part two, in part two, we found evidence for Kuhn's normal science in the context of collective curiosity, but not Fire Robin's characteristic list process or Lakatosh's research program. And then in part three, we found evidence for the information gap theory, the compression progress theory, and conformational change theories in psychology, which each offer different cognitive affordances. But collectively, the work um, provides a connective counterpoint to the more common acquisitional account of curiosity in humans and provides evidence that we can use network operationalizations um, to test these theories in a really concrete way. So with that, I want to acknowledge the interdisciplinary teams that were involved in these three different studies. The first study was led by David Leiden Staley, who I mentioned, in collaboration with Perry Zern, Dale Zoe, who is a grad student in neuroscience, and Anne Blevins, who was a postdoc mathematician um, at the University of Pennsylvania. Part two, this was the study of collective curiosity, science concept networks, that was led by Harang Zhu, who was a PhD student in, in neuroscience. We also collaborated, though, um, with a philosopher of science, Julio Tuma, and a historian of science, Judith Kaplan, um, because we were investigating these uh, historical and philosophical theories, um, and that's not something that we had immediate expertise in. So they joined the team um, and were really important in uh, determining how we operationalize those theories. In the third and final section, where we studied psychological theories, that was led by Shubankar Patenkar, who's a grad student with me right now, um, Jason Kim, who did work in um, the uh, in conformational mechanics when he was with me before he um, actually is now a postdoc at Cornell, um, and Chris Lynn, who was a grad student in physics with me and now is a postdoc at Princeton, and Matthew Ole, who is a grad student right now in the electrical and systems engineering department at Penn. So as you can see, people are from very different disciplines and have, um, I'm excited to have been able to collaborate with them to, to create these studies. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I would be very glad to take questions. Great. <clears throat> well, thank you, um, Danny, for that very <clears throat> Simulating very uh, interdisciplinary talk. I'll just remind folks who are on the Zoom call, if you have um, a question, please post in the chat. Um, um, I, if I may, take this opportunity as, as host to ask a couple of questions. Um, so I'm trying to sort of um, come to some of this work from, you know, my backgrounds in psychology. And, and so, you know, in the world of affective science, which, um, which you may know, you know, one of the debated um, issues is, 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 is whether emotions have these sort of unique signatures or so-called um, fingerprints. Um, and this, this discussion often um, revolves around the sort of assumed uh, universality, right, of emotions. Um, and, and I know you're not, I know you're defining curiosity more in terms of um, network building um, as opposed to, say, emotions. But I'm wondering if you see connections to this um, this idea that that curiosity, um, you know, to the extent that it's a it's a universal sort of um, uh, phenomenon, could be um, sort of you know uh, read in the face uh, or in you know patterns of you know bodily changes um, in the same way that you may say you know read word read words off of of a, of a page, for example. Yeah, so you're thinking about how uh, people can be curious about other people's emotions and understanding 
their emotion networks. Is that what you're phrasing? Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering if you see parallels um, between this notion that curiosity might act like an emotion, and if so, if you sort of accept that as a premise, whether this perspective on emotions as being kind of universal um, that you can kind of identify through the face in terms of expression, through the body in terms of physiological signatures, whether that, that account of curiosity resonates with you at all. I think that's really interesting. I mean, I guess I see, I personally see curiosity less as an emotion and more as a practice. Maybe where I see really interesting connections is um, how we build our emotion transition networks. And I've been influenced by some of, in this um, space, by ideas that David Leidensdaley initially brought to my attention um, on emotion networks and how we transition between different emotions and how, um, that emotion transition network can be altered by contextual factors. And I'm really interested in how our emotion networks might, um, how they come about at all, uh, how they differ for people who have different experiences. Um, and that could be something as simple as, you know, socioeconomic status, but it could also be um, experiences of marginalization or um, experiences of one emotional context at home and a completely different one at school. Um, and so I'm really interested in how we engage curiously to build those emotion transition networks and how they differ, how we bu build them differently in different contexts. So that's where I feel like I'm, I'm very excited about the connection, um, but I could just be missing where you're going with the question. No, 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 that, that's great. Um, there's a question here from Eileen Graham. Eileen, can I, should I read it or do you want to ask um, your, should you turn on your video? So I'm not sure if you wanted to ask oh. your question. Or... Um, either way, it's fine. I'm happy to ask it again. Yeah, please. Um, so yeah, I thought this was an excellent talk. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so I am drawing upon my own discipline, which is um, largely based in personality psychology. And I'm curious about the extent to which you've drawn upon personality theory as you've developed and tested these models. Um, partly because openness to experience is one uh, fairly well validated trait, um, and a facet of that is curiosity. Um, and it has been found to predict a lot of outcomes, including knowledge acquisition, um, executive function, other cognitive abilities. Um, and that, like, as you were speaking, um, it kind of it felt like it fit neatly into a couple of places that might explain individual differences and in how people might approach um, some of these search paradigms that you were testing. And also as an aside, my husband is a geometric topologist. So <laughs> I, for the first time in my life, cool. had a talk where like his ramblings <laughs> actually were relevant. I was like, oh, what she's talking about. That's so really cool. That's neat. Um, yeah, so definitely openness to experience. I, I am familiar with the, some of the work that connects openness to experience with curiosity. Um, and we did study that in the first um the first paper that I described, first section of the talk. So in David Lydon's Daly's work with the Wikipedia browsing, um, what we found is that deprivation sensitivity was a better predictor of the network organization than openness to experience. And I don't know if that's because deprivation sensitivity is more related to epistemic curiosity, um, whereas openness to experience is assessed a little bit more broadly um, in the in the scales that we used. So it's possible that the, the better predictor comes from the one that is more targeted to epistemic curiosity, perhaps. Um, but the fact that we see sensation seeking and individual differences in sensation seeking from, from a person's norm as predictive of uh, their browsing character uh, week to week suggests that I mean, that's another connection to openness to experience in some sense, right? So it suggests that it's definitely there and relevant, um, but the stronger correlation was with deprivation sensitivity. That's really interesting you brought that up. Me, I actually side texted with Anthony about this as you were talking about it, um, because deprivation sensitivity, as you were talking about it, I was like, that sounds like high openness. Like they sound mm -hmm. very similar. Like somebody who is high in openness is very sensitive to being deprived of information and will go seek it out. 
Um, so now I'm curious <laughs> of um, how deprivation sensitivity is measured. And I, I am not a psychometrician, but I would love to see how like the factor order structures of those compare and um, yeah, how, how similar those constructs really are. And I think it's super interesting that um, there was more predictive power of deprivation sensitivity over openness. Yeah, I think that I, I actually should go back to some of the original papers that developed the deprivation sensitivity scale, because um, it's not something that we developed, and see if they, I, I am guessing that they also um, report the correlations with openness to experience, just to demonstrate that it's capturing something slightly different, at least. Okay. Um, so I'll see if I can find that, and if I yeah. do, I can send it to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Eileen. Um... James, would you like to ask your question? Sure. I um, just want to echo uh, how wonderful this talk was, uh, Danny. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and as a parent with a small child, like thinking about curiosity and how it develops also with a teenager, and it's, it just mm -hmm. changes over time. And so I guess my, uh, I have a lot of questions uh, that came up, but um, one, let's see if I uh, would be, if you um, think, so, okay, I'll start with, is the landscape across which you're searching, how influential is that? You know, mm -hmm. Wikipedia is pre-organized, you know, I'm, I'm, because it, I'm crazy, some of us are doing a Gibsonian reading group. And so we're talking about like the environment is not actually atoms and photons, it's, you know, it's trees and, and ambient light. Um, so you asked, you, you've based all of these inferences, it seems on Wikipedia searching, which is pre-organized in a lot of ways that have some built-in structure um, and, and I, I'm sure you've thought a lot about that and have reasons. I'm just curious if you would have predict different behavior in um, in different spaces in um, in less structured informational um, environments. And yeah, uh, th that's such a good question. Um, so it's something that we're thinking about, but that we had not assessed carefully in the previous studies. Right now we're collaborating um, formally with the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the foundation that's behind Wikipedia. Um, and so through that collaboration, we have access to browsing data, anonymized browsing data um, for millions of users instead of 149 people who are browsing, which is great. Um, in the context of studying that data, we have found initial evidence that the structure of science Wikipedia in terms of its network structure is very different than the structure of um, pages in the humanities and cultural anthropology and you know sports and etc. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Then the question is when people are browsing, do they browse differently on the science pages versus the humanities pages? And the answer is yes, they browse very differently. And so now we're trying to develop statistical assessments that ask, do people browse differently on those two sectors of Wikipedia um, only because the structure is different or partially also because the person who's drawn to science concepts tends to browse in this way and the person who's drawn to humanities or cultural anthropology concepts is, tends to browse in this way. Um, so we're doing an assessment that tries to statistically parse those two um, ex possible explanations and how much variability each explains. But I also think it would be great to follow up using a um, more controlled experiment where the same person is asked to browse science concepts for a day and then tomorrow is asked to browse humanities concepts for a day and i think that that would provide more you know explicit accounting of the two explanatory factors so that's just to say that your point is very important um and the jury is still out thank you so much yeah, that's a that's wonderful, right, within Wikipedia. And then you could do, yeah, a lot of things yeah. to explore from there. Thanks, James. Um, just looking to see if there's other questions in the chat. Um, so uh, I have a question about, um, so, so you describe in, in, in earlier in your talk and, and actually in your book, you, you describe these sort of three um, archetypes of, of curiosity, the, the, the thing called the busybody, the, the hunter and the, and the dancer. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, you can imagine, you know, all of these um, phenotypes uh, existing in the same person. And um, 
I'm sort of interested in the sort of the the time scale here. Um, that is, um, if you if you were to think of um, studying these phenotypes within a single individual, how frequently would you be? You know, what what would be the sampling rate if, if, there, was, if there was a way of measuring these things? How often would you be sort of measuring them within an individual? I know it's a very kind of abstract question, but I'm, I'm curious of your thoughts. If you wanted to see transitions between the different styles yeah. in a single person, yep. yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I have definitely thought about the time scale of science projects as one in which we move between the three styles. So at the beginning of a science project, we might be more like a busybody. We go to talks at conferences that we wouldn't typically go to. We might read outside of our immediate area. We're searching for the sort of next question to be obsessed about. Um, and then once we've chosen that question, then we become a little bit more like a hunter and we search for particular pieces of information that help us to develop the new theory or come up with a new discovery. And then at the end of the project, we try to think about why it all matters. Um, and so we try to connect what we've found to previous theories or to previous experiments, and that requires a little bit of leaping. Um, and and even um, speculating about how our findings might relate to other areas, uh, and that speculation can lead to new hypotheses. So I can see in the context of science that we do move through the three styles um, in series and that over really long time scales. But I don't know if that's the ideal situation in which to be studying the transitions. Um, I actually wonder whether, I'm very curious about social curiosity, and I wonder if that's a context in which it would be easier to study the transitions. So when you first meet somebody, you might be more like the busybody asking kind of random questions. And then as soon as you latch on to a, a space that you're both excited about, then you it sounds awful to have like a hunting curiosity for another person, but let's just run with it. Um, you, you know, maybe you ask a bunch of questions in a stream that's connected uh, and that helps you to understand more about that person in that particular dimension that you share, right? And then you might have more of the dancer style toward the end where you then broaden out to other topics that may be related. So I feel, I feel like all of that could happen in a single conversation. And so I'm envisioning that, um, communication would be a really neat place to start. Awesome. Um, well, um, I don't see any other questions, but if, 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 um, if I'm, oh, oh, James, did you have one more question? I do have one um, briefly, if I can, uh, and I know there might be some others brewing in, in the crowd, but I, I'm curious about the sort of fake news epidemic and the yeah. dilemmas around labeling things as fake news. You know, if I believe that the 2020 election was stolen. And I'm searching for how Hunter Biden's laptop was instrumental in that somehow. I'm just picking two like kind of random conspiracy theories. And if I come across an article that suggests uh, that the 2020 election was not stolen, I'm not actually curious about that upper level core belief. I don't want to find information about that. I want to find information about Hunter Biden's laptop and how it was supporting that rigged election. Um, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So these layers of kind of openness or layers of deprivation sensitivity and how our kind of prior beliefs and goals influence those network properties of the, the search yeah. walk. And yeah, I really like the fact that you brought that up. It actually connects for me to another area of philosophy where um, there's some discussion about ethical curiosity and non-ethical curiosity. And I guess you could consider curiosities that are completely blind, blind, blinded, or bl that uses the, the what the things the horses have, no, what, tunnel vision? Yeah. 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 yeah, blinders. Kind of, yeah, blinders or tunnel vision, yes, exactly, so that kind of curiosity could be unethical in some situations, because you're not open to countervailing evidence, um, so 
there is, for example, Perry talks about this one kind of curiosity. He calls it the spectacle erasure formation of curiosity, where you spectacularize something, you objectify something, and you sim and you laud it as the most amazing thing um, and ask tons of questions about it, but you simultaneously erase. So it's the spectacle erasure formation. You simultaneously erase its history, its multiplicity, um, its depth. This happens, for example, um, it happens, well, and a, one example would be freak sh historically, freak shows, um, where somebody who had bodily differences would be spectacularized. Here's a spectacle. We should all be really curious about this different body. Um, but the, the personhood of that individual was completely erased. So I think, so that's, an, that's a historical example. But I think that that can also happen in a different way in the way that we engage with ideas more broadly, maybe when we are too focused, we focus on that thing, that concept as a spectacle, um, and then erase its complexity or its possibility for being only partly true or um, its potential to change. Or So I'm really interested in how to think and study, think about and study um, patterns of ethical curiosity that could be relevant for how we do science. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. Even like curiosity search patterns as a another measure of of bias or curiosity yes. patterns. Like yeah. a, you can yeah. even get assessment like, oh, you're you're not searching in an optimal way to find out things that might challenge your beliefs. Right. Like you you yeah. do a little activity and obviously people who do that activity are probably more open minded in general, but <laughs> yes. Um, I want to give the last word here to Aisha. She, she has a question. Hi. Um, okay, so I would have written out my questions, but they're like kind of confusing for me. So we'll see. Um, they're kind of they're three different ones. So um, the first one was about IQ and whether you took. I know it's super problematic, but whether you took um, intelligence testing into consideration when looking at the individual differences between like curiosity and curiosity styles. Um, and then another question was more of a clarification question. Um, so within the conformational change model, did that include backtracking and removal of information? So like when we learn that something, Lord, <laughs> when we learn that something is no longer like fact, um, how is that taken into consideration? And then I'm really sorry, but last question. Um, Challenging so, my working memory capacity. I can write them out. Or write <laughs> no, go ahead. No, I, I think I'm there. Um, and then the last one was, um, I guess, more like philosophical because I love, I just love the blend of like philosophy and math and it's awesome. Anyway, um, is there, I guess, does your data suggest that like maybe possibly we are specializing in these like three different curiosity drives, like the busybody, the hunter and the dancer? Like, um, is it, could it be that like we as a species are specializing in these things to better um, I guess, better fill in these knowledge gaps mm -hmm. um, in ways that like we can't do as like individuals. So like if we're all just like busy body or we're all just like dancers and all of that. Um, that is yeah. a really interesting question. I'm going to start with that one. Um, I don't know how we could demonstrate if it is something that we are specializing in purposefully and we're sort of evolving to do that. What, but I do, I have spent a lot of time thinking about the fact that those three styles to me feel like they are characteristic of moving in different dimensional spaces. So let me say that more simply. Um, the busybody is somebody who's moving in kind of a, a one-dimensional way. Um, so they are, you know, every, every step that they take is linear. Um, and that's in contrast to the hunter who's in some two-dimensional plane and hunting in a particular angular direction, right? Um, so I think about the hunter as moving in a two-dimensional space and the busy body moving in a more one-dimensional space. Um, the uh, dancer is somebody who's leaping, right? So they're in some knowledge space here and then they leap to another knowledge space that requires a third dimension of the conceptual space. Mm -hmm. So is it the case that these are just a low dimensional projection or low dimensional projections of the kinds of actions you could take in a knowledge space? And if so, then there would be a fourth dimensional um, 
phenotype and a fifth dimensional phenotype and whatever. Um, I think that the, the easiest way to, for me to think about the fourth dimensional one is that people are moving between the different curiosity styles. And so time is the fourth dimension. Um, and so that's the one I'm really interested in studying more is how do people move between these different styles um, if we add that dimension of time and what kind of characteristics would we see then? So I wonder if that's why we're noticing these three characteristics is because that just maps out the kinds of movements that you can have um, in an, an, an low dimensional spaces. Um, the second, okay, so you, your initial question on IQ, we didn't see initial evidence for um, the a, a correlation between IQ and the browsing patterns in in David's study um yeah so that's we don't see evidence for that um it's possible that with a very 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 large sample we would be able to see some correlation but um but we we don't at the moment and I also sort of wonder I don't think one style is actually better in an intellectual sense in terms of intellectual affordances than the other. I think probably what's better, if there was something that's better, is knowing how and when to use each of the styles um, efficiently for what it is that you want to get done. So that's my hypothesis, but I haven't been able to test it yet. And then... Mm, oh, the confirmational change one. I, that one was like whether oh, backtracking oh, yeah, and removal of information. Yeah, so the theory itself does include the breaking of edges. And in fact, in the very the very last chapter of our book is on cracking. It's about it's about how we break connections we've built before when we recognize that they are no longer useful to us or accurate or anything else, and that that allows for the changes that we might need in the future. So absolutely, for confirmational change theory, um, breaking or cracking edges is very important. However, in the study that I showed you, um, we don't have a really good way of assessing whether and how people might be breaking connections in their mind. So that remains kind of an open um, experimental question, uh, but it is part of the theory more generally. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, questions. Thank you Danny, for this great um, presentation. And um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, I know we're at time here. So thanks, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Danny. Great. Thank you.